have a Britain display, which is uh, right as you go down, you go down here to the right. Uh, they've got a beautiful full-scale Spitfire. Well, the Spitfire is probably one most beautiful airplane ever built because there are no straight lines on the airplane. Everything is elliptical or, or curved, and it's really a darling airplane. But there were really two airplanes in the Battle of Britain, and the other one was this hefty guy who was the, uh, who did the heavy lifting, and uh, I'll, that's what I'm going to tell you about. So Terry and I talked, and we agreed that uh, the hurricane would be a good idea for the next uh, airplane. So that, that started uh, actually only one month after we dedicated the uh, uh, <coughs> albatross. So let me go down. Okay. That's how the albatross looks downstairs uh, in the World War I Museum, which is to the left as you go, and uh, you can stop down there. The museum's open until five, and uh, we'd like you to uh, do that. Okay, first of all, thanks to Jim Kittrick, who's a member of QED along with Hudson and, and uh, Dick and, uh, and me, and uh, Terry is a curator. He determines what goes in here <coughs> and where it goes, and. Uh, he built, he, he flies his own Blue Angels airplane that is one of the most gorgeous paint jobs I've ever uh, seen for a, uh, for a light plane. Uh, Kelly helped us set up here, Katrina's the head of volunteers. I'm also a volunteer down here and I keep telling uh, Katrina that I'm really busy at home working on my things. I haven't been able to spend much time. Uh, Roy Valley, Yaria, uh, Carol and I for, for relaxation, take summer courses at Oxford University. In London. In London. In London. No, in Oxford. In London. And uh, uh, one, we were there, one, we, we took our first course was the uh, English Country House in Film and uh, Literature. Which, that was a lot of fun. So then the next year, they're gonna have a course on the Battle of Britain. Oh. And without telling Carol, I signed up for that right away. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a week long course, uh, you stay in the, uh, Stay at the dorm. It's a lot of fun. And one of the places we went was the RAF Museum uh, in Hendon, London. And I started doing research on that, even though I hadn't finished the uh, uh, albatross yet. So some of the uh, documents and, and pictures actually come from the uh, Royal Air Force Museum. And then uh, I hot Coronado Village hardware. And that's where I pick up all the little bitty pieces that uh, don't come. Uh, with uh, everything else, and uh, that, that's a great picture. Well, here, here's what I'm going to talk about, just this briefly. Four simple things. The aircraft as it was originally built, the model derived from the aircraft, the famous pilot who flew it, and then finally about the Battle, uh, the battle of Britain. So a very simple uh, agenda. Uh, I always wondered what happened to the Sopwith Company uh, after World War I. Sopwith was the most famous uh, British airplane manufacturer, built the Sopwith Camel. You know, Snoopy flies yeah. the Camel against the Red Baron. <laughs> and uh, Snoopy is one of the few pilots who can fly that airplane because it was a very dangerous airplane to fly. It was very short coupled, had tremendous uh, torque. Uh, anyway, Harry Hawker was Sopwith's test pilot. And he held uh, several records uh, himself, in fact, uh, including Spitfire, or rather, uh, spin recovery technique. And you'll be interested to know, Len, uh, that the British uh, establishment thought spinning was so dangerous, they prohibited teaching spin recovery in pilot training <laughs> until 1917. So a lot of people died by getting into a spin. When you go into a stall, then you go into a spin. If you don't know how to recover, it's one of the basic uh, things. So, the hurricane came from, well, first of all, Harry Hawker and Thomas Sopwith. Sopwith Company went bankrupt, but Harry Hawker and, and Sopwith got together for Hawker Engineering, 1920. They have all these biplanes coming out of World War II, fabric and wood, and they start to develop metal covered airplanes, and that's what this is. The Hawker Fury, 1930. See, they took a basic design, just took incremental improvements to it by a stronger engine and metal on the forward part of the fuselage, still a biplane, I mean, it, still inhibited by all the factors of two wings. And by the way, this company still exists. 
They are now called Armstrong Sidley. And they build part of the F-15 and part of the Joint Strike Fighter, uh, the F-35, and uh, other things. So I, I thought that was interesting. Now, the Hurricane, this baby here, yeah, although it looks old and heavy, it is heavy, and it looks slow, but it was the first airplane in the Royal Air Force, operational, to go faster than 300 miles an hour, which they never were able to do with the biplanes. So it has that feature. Secondly, it's the first airplane with an enclosed cockpit, which for us pilots is fairly important since this airplane can now get to 25 or 28,000 feet and it gets cold and uh, oxygen, you need oxygen. And uh, thirdly, it is the first airplane with retractable landing gear. If the airplane only does 120 miles an hour, you don't have enough, uh, you don't need retractable landing gear, but at 300 miles an hour, the wind and the drag are enough that you have to do that. And I'll tell you a secret, uh, Terry, uh, getting the landing gear, buying the, the fairly expensive landing gear, and then putting in all the details of how the landing gear actually looked was, took more time than almost anything uh, on the airplane. So these things are all added, and it's got uh, a brake line that goes down for the hydraulic fluid and you know all the details I've tried to put into it. So it's famous for those three things. It was first flown in 1935, right after the Spitfire was flown, but the Spitfire took longer in development, and so the Hurricane was operational uh, first, and they started making squadrons in uh, 38 and 39. <coughs> now, this is, how, this is how the model was constructed. Let me go back and see. Oh, there we go, okay. Well, now we're switching to the model itself. This is the way the airplane was built. The model is built just like the airplane, in that they were transitioning from wood and fabric World War I airplanes to all metal airplanes, but they only did it halfway on the Hurricane. The whole aft section is built just like this with ribs and stringers, and it's covered with uh, Irish muslin. And one of the advantages was that when you get shot through the rear fuselage, you don't need a metal craftsman, they just slap a piece of cloth on there and make a band-aid. <laughs> and it had very high in commission rates. Its readiness was very high because it was much easier to repair because it was easier to manufacture. And I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. Now, they realized that with a heavier engine, and by the way, the Spitfire, and I'll have a comparison later, they both used the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, 1,070 horsepower. So you, since you have a more powerful engine, you need metal around the front part of the airplane and they extend it back to the cockpit because that's where more stress uh, occurs. So that's the way the airplane is built. They get in on the left side, they climb over this wall, but this, and I have it down uh, right here, this is an emergency escape hatch because these airplanes were hard to bail out of. No ejection seat. They, they blew the canopy off and put the thing down and went over the side and dove for the rear of the wing, hoping not to get hit by the tail. <laughs> this is how the airplane was built. I built the airplane just, I built the model just like the airplane. So I had uh, balsa wood covered the entire fuselage where the uh, metal was gonna go. And th this is very thin, uh, thinner than uh, tin foil uh, metal that goes on and I cut it and installed it in the same shape as the metal panels on the airplane. So it's not one big sheet, it goes on in each individual uh, sheet. And this is how they built the airplane with the wings attached down through the landing gear, which makes this a very strong section. They didn't build the fuselage, and build the wings and then marry the two together as most airplanes builders do. They built it just like this. So these lines that you see are replicated on the airplane and you can come up and look at it afterwards. And so these lines, I slightly darkened them with a little spray so you can see and they're all held on by rivets and I put rivets in all of the 
uh, all of those, so you get an idea how the airplane was built. A uh, thousand rivets, maybe. Uh, uh, I was telling Terry the, uh, the landing gear took a lot of time because there's a lot of space in here. There are hydraulic lines, uh, brake lines, and other uh, things, and so all that was included in the building of the model. Now, unlike the Albatross downstairs, the controls in the cockpit do not move the controls, but all the controls on the airplane are movable, and you can see how they work the tail, even the uh, trim tabs on the vertical and horizontal uh, tail. And that's how the model looks complete. This is the runway uh, out in front of our house for people in the caves. You may think of this as the uh, soccer, soccer field. <laughs> but uh, it turned out uh, pretty good. These are the machine guns here. And I'll, uh, uh, let's, let's go back a little bit. I can tell you, let me tell you a little bit before we leave uh, the uh, airplane. Um, exhaust stacks here, the Rolls-Royce Merlin is a V12 engine with uh, exhaust. And so I did several things to make uh, the aircraft realistic. First of all, it has a gun camera out here, which is on the right wing, which uh, simulates the gun camera. It has uh, fuel tank intakes, uh, oil uh, intake, and the little uh, decal here says oil, nine gallons, and tells what grade the oil is. There are all kinds of little painting uh, uh, nomenclature on the airplane. Back here, there's a little hole, you can see a black hole. It says lift here. It's where they put a pipe in to lift the tail uh, off the ground. Uh, these are antennas for radio wires. Pass to the inside of the line all day. It's told them how to repair it. Uh, See, the other ones were, were numbers that were associated with building the uh, airplane. Uh, what, oh, one other thing. Um, this airplane was paid for by the people of Burma. You know, they contributed money, part of the Commonwealth. And so on the right-hand side of uh, the airplane, there's a Burmese flag and a nomenclature of Burma. And the squadron 257 was known as the boys from Burma. So it was a real Commonwealth. Uh, atmosphere. And that, uh, well, a couple other things. I traced all of the lines here are individual panel lines. And then I put uh, these, this is taped over, they tape over the gun uh, barrel uh, outlets until they fire the gun, you just fire right through the tape. It has no uh, difference. And this is smoke showing this, this, on this sortie, the pilot fired the guns and left these smoke marks. On, on the on the wings, the exhaust has uh, exhaust coming back where it's burned. Uh, so you know a few attempts at <coughs> realism of what the airplane really looked like. RG, what's underneath? What's that? It's a big air scoop. There are two air scoops. One here is for the oil cooler, and this one was the to bring in air to cool the water cooled or glycol cooled engine. So liquid cooled engine which makes it very streamlined, mm -hmm. as opposed to a radial engine that's cooled by air. So that's the big air scoop down there, and they shared that with the Spitfire. All airplanes have some kind of an air, coo air, air cooler if they have uh, a liquid-cooled engine. So I put a lot of details. I built, I actually built the inside of the uh, air cooler, showing the screens and everything, so a lot of fun. Now. <laughs> The, uh, we'll go back, maybe we'll go back one. Yeah, okay. Downstairs, when you see the uh, Spitfire in the Battle of Britain display, this young fellow is standing in front of the airplane. Now, this fellow's name is Robert Stanford Tuck. He was uh, one of the most famous of the British Spitfire pilots in the Battle of Britain. In fact, there are some other pictures around here uh, I should have out on the table. I bought a model, uh, I bought this model of the uh, airplane and the one on the uh, cape back there. And uh, it had an endorsement from Robert Stanford Tuck. His picture was on the front of the 
box that the model came in. So I began to ask myself, who was this guy? And it turns out uh, he was born in 1916 in World War One. He ran away from home at age 16, joined the Merchant Marine, and sailed all around the world for two or three years. He joined the Royal Air Force in 1935. Now he's an enlisted man, but he was one of the first Spitfire pilots to be trained on the airplane. And so when the Battle of Britain came in 1940, he was made uh, first a flight leader and then a squadron commander of a Spitfire squadron. And on uh, September 15th, right in the middle of the Battle of Britain, he transferred him, and he must have been quite chagrined, they transferred him to be a squadron commander of a hurricane squadron, which most pilots would cut their wrists, you know, at that, because going from, and he describes it, that going from the uh, Spitfire is, is described as a lightweight, agile uh, racehorse. It is very, very maneuverable. It weighs only two thirds the amount of, of weight that the uh, hurricane is. And these guys were so good, they were the only airplane that was a match for the Messerschmitts that were uh, protecting the bombers coming in the Battle of Britain. But he came to realize, he writes about this also, that the Hurricane was a different kind of an airplane. It was heavier, it was a couple thousand pounds heavier, it was a wonderful gun platform. And here for uh, pilots, here's an interesting thing. The guns are mounted outside the propeller ring, so they don't need synchronization. They're all grouped together, one side and the other, 30 caliber guns. The Spitfire has two guns inboard, one out here and another one way out near the wingtip. When you fire the Spitfire, the airplane actually warped. And, you, you, and they were not as easy to synchronize to fire at a particular point so when, but when you fired the guns on a hurricane, it had a tremendous effect because all the bullets were clustered very close together. So the Royal Air Force realizing this, well, first of all, um, one of the details was this is a British airplane, Royal Air Force, British made mannequin pilot, uh, and so they're, they're all accordion. So that's them. These guys, this is the number of victories that Bob Tuck had by the Battle of Britain. Wow. He flew uh, in the defense of Dunkirk and got two aircraft the first day he flew, and he got two bombers the next day. So he was a very, very good pilot. And in those days, uh, and today, uh, pilots get to mark on their airplane the number of their, of their victories. By the way, this year, 1918, is also the 100th anniversary of the Royal Air Force. So there are big celebrations all year long uh, in the uh, creation of the uh, Royal Air Force. Oh, th this is, this is uh, funny. Now, and I, now we're into the Battle of Britain. I just, love, I just love this. This is how British pilot training Trained fighter pilots, no kidding, before World War II. They loved this V formation. Now I notice, uh, Len, that they've got an instructor back here. He had nine airplanes up here in Vic. And I write in the book about Oswald Bulky, this is almost the stupidest formation you can have in combat. The other one's more stupid than this is when you're in trail formation. And the reason is that this guy is a leader. He had a few more hours than anybody else. What is this guy looking at? He is only looking at that guy. And I'll tell you, there's about two feet between their wingtips. Oh, wow. And what about this guy? He's looking at this guy who's going up and down and that guy. And what about the third guy out here? He's watching these two guys who are going up and down, and the leader. And I pity these guys here on the end. They're like the end of a whip. I mean, tell you, even good pilots have trouble flying formation 
and this makes it very, very hard, and the result is that they're in combat looking for other airplanes. Who is doing the looking? <laughs> Only this guy. <laughs> Everybody else is trying to avoid running into the guy ahead of him. That's why it's a dumb formation. And when they met the Germans, who had been in the, Civil, in the Spanish Civil War, who were flying two airplanes far apart, line of rest, and there are two wingmen out on the other side, and they're looking across each other, half a mile apart. It's called a swarm. It's called the finger four. Leader, number two, his wingman. Number three, who is more experienced, and number four. It's called finger four. Either finger you want, and they can, very, very maneuverable. And it took the, in fact, Bob Tuck refused to fly this formation by September of 1940. After three months, he learned this is a stupid formation. And he was one of the guys that broke with doctrine and did his own uh, thing. So that's a lot of fun. Now, so the Battle of Britain begins. That's a hurricane, a bulletproof glass up here, rearview mirror. And somebody asked me why the rearview mirror. I said, because that's when you're getting shot at and hit, you look up there and you can see the guy who's killing you. <laughs> It's not much good for much else because you're supposed to be uh, supposed to be looking around. Tail wheel not retractable. Didn't really need it. They weren't at such a high speed, so he was left. You don't buy the spark, spare parts to uh, retract it. There's the Spitfire. Now, isn't that a beautiful airplane? I mean, just look at it. You know, it has a much thinner wing. Everything is elliptical. The tail. The wings, there are advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are 30 miles an hour faster than the Hurricane, much more maneuverable, very lightweight, and extremely good as a fighter, and that's what it looks like in uh, level flight. Now, I thought this would be as a, together they were a lethal pair. They both started at the same time. The Spitfire was derived from the Supermarine uh, Racing uh, uh, float planes of the 1920s. You can see it's faster. It weighs about 1,600 or about 1,000 pounds less. They both had eight machine guns. They could, and only 30 caliber, they could never figure out how to put a 50 caliber in them. It shook the wings so bad they couldn't, they couldn't sustain a, a, a 50. So they gave them the Spitfire the mission of attacking the escorting fighters, and the Hurricane went after the bomber which was a very useful uh, division of, of labor. Now notice this, it took 15,000 man hours to manufacture a Spitfire because there are no two ribs the same size in the wing. Everyone is different and had to be made from a different uh, jig. The Hurricane was produced in two thirds the time and the result was that there were 19 squadrons of Spitfires in the Battle of Britain, and there were 31 squadrons of Hurricanes. So the Hurricane, although it's the little brother of the Battle of Britain, it really bore the brunt of the battle and, uh, <coughs> and accounted for uh, the majority of, uh, of victories. And so uh, there we are. We're donating it today to Terry and to the museum. Uh, we hope it goes into the Battle of Britain display to uh, accompany the uh, Spitfire. Uh, uh, just a couple of other uh, uh, things about it. I mentioned it was built by the uh, uh, money from, uh, from uh, Burma. And on the right-hand side in this escape door, the emergency door, there's a Burmese flag and then the, the entitlement of uh, Burma underneath the uh, uh, thing. He was not Burmese, he was English. but. Uh, some of the guys were uh, from Burma. So, any questions? Dan. RG, it throws me back to my uh, making these plastic model days 50 years ago, but it seems to me, well, you were talking about the, the retractable landing gear and the speed. Wasn't there a German plane, primarily a dive bomber, that had, that I assume flew at over 300 miles an hour, but didn't it have a a, a stationary. It uh, did. It was I can't remember the name of it. Junkers 87, a Junkers 87, 
It's called a Stuka, it's a dive bomber, yeah. used extensively in the campaign against Poland and against France, but when it ran up against the fighters, both the Hurricane and the Spitfire, it was slow because of the fixed landing gear, uh, even though they had wheel pants on it, it was slower, it could not defend itself very well. It only had one little machine gun uh, in the back of the airplane and a couple firing forward, and they lost so many uh, Stukas in the Battle of Britain that Goring withdrew them after the first several weeks and they didn't fly again. So they were using level bombers uh, for the rest of the Battle of Britain. Good question. The, the fixed landing gear, it was not anywhere near a 300 mile hour airplane. Um, yes, Bob? What was the time in the air before refueling? Pardon? The time in the air before required refueling. Uh, none of these airplanes were fueled in the air. No, but before they had come back. Um, they're burning gasoline engines, and so I'd say it had about two hours endurance, Just maybe an hour and a half, which is fine for an interceptor. You know, it goes off and, and you're defending your own homeland. That's fine. They had, both the Spitfire and the Hurricane had trouble when the offensive after <coughs> D-Day when the offensive kept going forward and they were required to go farther, they were never uh, good enough to escort bombers into Germany. Never escort. They were built for uh, England and France and Germany before World War II were all thinking about tactical support in short range missions. And it took the United States to build the long range airplanes to defend our bombers. So we didn't get that until late 1943, 1944.